I mean, I think this is, for us, probably a, a good segue into a talk on joy. Um, because joy seems to be, uh, instead of that sort of happiness when everything is right in the world, joy is instead this thing that comes in and bol bolsters our faith and our strength in the midst of the storm. Um, I'm a little sad this week that we don't have our Christmas pageant this week, which is typically what we do on the third Sunday of Advent. And um, like when I think of joy, uh, that's to me such a great depiction of that, these little children coming out. And um, I always think of, you know, we were just sharing about this earlier, uh, the little Jude Sager when he was like four would come out in a Spider-Man costume and then have the sheep costume over it. Right? Can you kind of picture it? So you got like the muscles poking out underneath the sheep costume. You just always felt a little safer knowing that uh, Spider-Man was there undercover. But um, just such sweet thing to see the faith depicted through the lens of children and uh, the wonder that comes with that and the magic that comes with that. And I think it's always for us a sort of remembering. And in the time of Advent, that really is underlying all of it, a... Um, a time of remembering. And joy has this way of kind of reorienting us back to what really matters. Um, I've heard joy described as this constant sense of well-being. And given the year that we've had, um, that seems almost unrealistic, right? In the midst of division, in the midst of concern, in the midst of anxiety, how do we live with this pervasive sense of well-being? And it requires a way of seeing, and I want to say it requires an attention to detail. But so often where we look for joy is in all the wrong places. And joy has this way, um, we have to learn, I think, to see the joy. Amidst all the distraction, amidst all the noise, seeing joy requires um, a focus. But when we see it, we realize it by its texture. And uh, again, Joy is different than happiness. Happiness has so much to do with circumstance, and joy has this way of kind of piercing into our circumstance. It brings with it this sort of lightness that comes. I was thinking that even as we sang worship this morning and feeling in the midst of that, these little bright spots of joy piercing through. And what happens to my own heart, the weariness lifts. And joy, I think part of the reason we find joy so hard is it requires time. It requires space in our lives. And we live in a, in a world that um, is driven by efficiency, driven by things getting faster and faster and faster. And these things have a way of killing joy. Joy requires a sort of leisurely pace, I think, sometimes to see it. And I think what's surprising about joy, when I think back to it, I think joy is almost always best captured in stories. So think about that for just a second. If you were to describe a time of joy in your own life, can you think of one? And what do you go back to there? Like the real deep joy where you're like, get that sense of like, yes, this is what life is supposed to be like. And I think some of my deepest moments of joy happen in a time where I felt the most vulnerable or was suffering. Probably my most profound encounter with God and his comfort came in a time of deep loneliness. And it broke in. In reading through a scripture, it was like God was speaking right to me. But more than just something that I felt in my head, I felt it in my whole body. And this, you know, I've heard it said that the divine is always invisible, but holiness is always incarnate. There's a physicality to holiness when it comes. And these moments of joy, it's like you feel it in your cheeks. And to talk about joy in the midst of darkness, I think, is, to, um, is almost necessary in understanding the biblical story that we find ourselves in. Isaiah 9 in this prophetic word about the coming of Christ, says the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. 
They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. And this idea of these people wandering in the darkness, this is like our tribe, these are our people wandering through the darkness and this light coming into the midst of that darkness, this light that directs our way. And what comes with it is an increase of joy. And Advent means coming in Latin. And we remember again and during this time, this coming of this light into darkness, but we're also reminded that the fullness of this story is yet to occur. The reality of what Christ has done, bringing truth into the midst of the darkness, has occurred, and we look back on that as an anchor point. But we also look ahead towards this beacon of light that is to come. N.T. Wright says we always have to remember what part of the story we're in. So he, he breaks it down in these kind of five, or you could say like six different chapters. The first chapter being the creation the next chapter being the fall. Chapter after that is Israel. Chapter after that is Jesus. And here in chapter 5, we find ourselves in the chapter of the church, the body here on earth, awaiting the last chapter, which we could call the new creation. And Advent reminds us is that we're not in chapter 6 yet, we're in chapter 5. We are still, in a sense, wandering, and yet we have this light. We're like the, the wise men following the star towards a hope. I read this in our first Advent service. Um, it's a quote from Walter Brueggemann, and it's there in your notes if you want um, to follow along. But he says, Advent does not begin in buoyancy or celebration or in a shopping spree. The natural habitat of Advent is a community of hurt. It is the voice of those who know profound grief, who articulate it and do not cover it over. But this community of hurt knows where to speak its grief, toward whom to address its pain. And because the hurt is expressed to the one whose rule is not in doubt, the community of hurt is profoundly a community of hope. And I like that idea. It's not of diminishing or ignoring the pain, instead speaking it to the one whose rule is secure. And so our hope isn't just in the reality of a new chapter. Our hope is in Christ, the one who came and the one who will come again. And in Isaiah, a little further down in verse 6, it describes Christ in these terms, our wonderful counselor, our almighty God, our everlasting father, and our prince of peace. I'm always struck by that term everlasting father. I think we think of Jesus as the son of God, but there's also part of his name, part of his calling is to be our father, our good father. And I like this when I think about joy because when I think for myself of my moments of joy, they almost always are around my kids playing chess with my daughter when she makes a good move that I didn't see coming or when I have breakfast with my other daughter Mia when I watch my son get a good wave when we're surfing, I feel this joy that comes in. Like I said before, I feel it in my cheeks. But this idea of fathering or parenting, I think is one of those windows into the joy of the Lord, what God must think when he thinks of us. And this um, makes me think of a painting. I'm inspired by Beth's talk last week. and. Um, so I have a painting there for you if, um, if you've got the app. And if you don't, you're going to have to look it up later. But there's this picture at one of my favorite museums, the Norton Simon, that's a painting of Joseph. And it's Joseph holding Jesus. And what you see is that love of the Father. One of the, my favorite parts of it is that Jesus is reaching up this little baby and he's grabbing onto Joseph's beard. And the tenderness, this gift of the Father's love for us. And Jesus says this to Philip. He says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And I think us feeling the strength of joy 
part of it requires this connection to that fatherly love. That it's God's joy in us that fills us with that strength. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Know and understand that the Father is in me. Spurgeon says, there is no unfathering Christ and there is no unchilding us. He is everlastingly a father to those who trust in him. And this is how joy allows us to endure, gives us strength to persevere. When we receive that delight of God, that's the thing that gives this pervasive sense of goodness. That that is God's heart towards each one of you. I think too often we fail to understand this and seek joy in all the wrong ways, in our own sort of self-reliance, in our own fearful independence. And it creates its own sort of earthly wisdom, the way that we look for joy. It brings with it the sort of fruit that um, you taste it and know this is bad fruit, this is worldly fruit. James 3, 13 through 18, we've read this a few times together, but he says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy, and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. This worldly pursuit of joy so often ends in gluttony, selfishness, jealousy. James goes on and says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace, reap a harvest of righteousness. And these themes of Advent, hope and peace and joy and love, are distinct and yet they're all so intertwined. And when we know this love of God, it has this way again of, of realizing that not only do we see ourselves as the beloved, but we can see each other as the same. It's not a scarcity to this love. God's heart is generous. And whether the world knows it or not, this is what they're looking for. This is the light that we need to guide us. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. In the beginning was the word, that word logos. is like, this is the heavenly wisdom, which is the name given to Christ. That light is the logos that comes into the world that shines there in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John goes on and says, um, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And I love how this sort of ties these threads together. First of all, we're reminded, you know, when Isaiah says Jesus was the eternal father, right? He was there before he's the creator, Jesus himself, or the Christ, creates the world and then comes as a baby in Christ. And that those who see and believe become like his children. And this truth, I think it's hard for us to fully swallow it. I, Patty and I were talking yesterday, and I didn't ask your permission to share this, but... Um, but Patty was like kind of going, look at, like God comes in as this child and then like sacrifices himself for this child. And like, who does this? Like, what kind of love is this? And I was thinking, I love that. This is like, 
spirituality 101. This is the most, like, you learn this your first day of Sunday school. And yet, years later, you find yourself still trying to get your mind around that, that kind of love. Paul says, um, may you have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. I think sometimes we, we, you know, we think we've got this all figured out. And the truth is God's love, the concept of that has to continue to grow and grow and grow in our lives, which sometimes requires the darkness to allow us to see even deeper God's love. I think of that with what John was just sharing. So often the love comes in the midst of the tragedy, in the midst of the vulnerability as we're like going, oh no, I don't have control whether it's a bad diagnosis or some form of news that we receive that um, feels like it knocks us down. So often joy then comes and shines into the midst of that place and God says, I'm still here. I've talked to him about these things as like breadcrumbs you're following. And sin has this way of blurring our vision and distorting reality. When you think about a season like this so often, what Christmas has become is just a consumeristic kind of gluttonous season, which leaves us feeling guilty or regretful or hungover. Or worse, I think that sometimes in this season we can become cynical or even bored. Certainly this year, we find ourselves often fearful or anxious or even resentful. And these things have this way of coming in in a toxic way and, and like cancerously eating away at our joy. And I think that having this focus um, requires some effort on our part. You know, when Jesus talks to his disciples on the night he's betrayed, he's in the garden and he says, watch and pray. And sometimes I think the key to the Christian life is caught up in those two words, this prayerful speaking and making our requests to God, but also an attention, our eyes open. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Having the eyes to see, training our eyes to see. And when we do see it, it has this powerful way of casting out fear, casting out worry. There's a quote I have in here that... Um, yeah, you can come back to you later. It's, it's too long. But it's from George MacDonald and one I love. But basically, the, the gist of the quote is saying that each one of us, when we've captured that joy, makes some secret part of God known to the world around us. That when we have this joy, not only does it strengthen us, but it, it makes our own hearts illumine. And in a world that's struggling... How desperately do they need to see that joy? And it's something really so basic as the Holy Spirit. But to understand, do we really understand that? I've read this quote to you before, but it's from Andrew Peterson. He says, so boil it all down, chop off the fat, get rid of the pet lizard because you can't afford to feed it anyway. Wrench your heart away from all the things you think you need for your supposed financial security your social status. Set fire to your expectations, your rights, and even your dreams. When all that is gone, it will be clear the only thing you ever really had was this wild and holy spirit that whirls about inside you, urging you to follow where his wind blows. I had a chance this last Thursday to um, meet with Steve Krantz's doctoral students, which was so fun. They're all writing their dissertations. And of course, they're all terrified because writing a dissertation is terrifying. And they were going around and sharing about this, but this one woman that, um, she, um, she's Hispanic, and so English was her second language. So she was doing her best to describe it to me, and then she would get caught up, and the person hosting it would have to translate for her. But she was writing her 
paper, her dissertation on this like simple work of the Holy Spirit. And she couldn't talk about it without tears as she talked about the closeness. And she started sharing these different stories, different occasions in her life where she was struggling and then God's Spirit was there. And to notice that, it's why we should consider struggles, trials as a gift. Because I think it's in those times that we so often see it, maybe for the first time. I was thinking about three things that it requires to help us see joy. And the first, I think, is patience. It requires time to notice. I remember writing this in my book about reading this one teacher that taught art at Harvard, and she would have her students sit for three hours in front of a painting. Can you imagine that? One painting, three hours. And kind of at each moment along that journey, what did you notice? What did you notice an hour in? What did you notice two hours in? That all of a sudden things start emerging that you never saw before. And that discipline of waiting and remaining there. The poet Mary Oliver, she writes, attention is the beginning of devotion. And I think this what we give our time to we all want the cliff notes. Like, let's just get to the point. God, just show up. Just give me the, give me the one quick word. When so on, often I think God wants us to just be with. We always think in terms of quality time, but I think God often is hungry for quantity time with us. I... Um, I think that it requires us not only to be to sit alone, but to sit still. Noticing joy requires stillness. And I was listening to something by this modern-day composer named Hans Zimmer. Has anybody heard of him? And he was talking about when he sits down to compose, he sits on his hands. Because if he doesn't, he'll just jump straight to the keyboard and start playing. And he goes, guaranteed what I'll do is I'll play something that I've already written, something that I already know. So he sits there on his hands and waits. And I think for us, we could take a lesson from this as well, especially during COVID where we're sitting at home, that we can sit at home and still be so distracted and so caught up. And this idea of sitting on our hands really is a reflection of listening. Are we listening to God? Waiting with expectation for his voice. Creating the space for it. And the third thing is to remain there with patience. I love how Teilhard Chardin says, trust the slow work of God. And Patty and I, during Advent, we've been reading through a book um, called The Supper of the Lamb, which is basically theology through, it's a combination of theology and a cookbook. This guy's really writing this sort of theology of food, and he's really hilarious. He's just a great writer, and he tells you, like, your first lesson is to, like, he wants you to slice an onion, but he wants you to take an hour to do it. Again, this, like, slowing down. But joy requires this, that the fast food that we eat, we know lacks so much nutrition and you eat it standing up and we lose the feast. That what God has for us comes slowly, but it's rich. Can you hear my chicken? <laughs> I know, she's giving me an amen maybe. He says this, food is the daily sacrament of unnecessary goodness, ordained for a continual remembrance that the world will always be more delicious than it is useful. Let me read that again. Food is the daily sacrament of unnecessary goodness, ordained for a continual remembrance that the world will always be more delicious than it is useful. And I think we as men so often are trying to create like a nutrition pill that we can swallow and we lose all the flavor, all the richness. 
that life is meant to be savored like a banquet, like a good stew that takes all day to cook. And the preparation and all that goes into it is part of the joy. It's a meal that's meant to be shared with others, to be eaten slowly. And in our hurry or in our worry or in our gluttony and our consuming, so often what we do is lose the joy. But this is here and it's there and it's waiting for us. When Jesus tells us to watch, he's telling us to pay attention because it's there and it's all around us. I just want to remind us on this third Sunday of Advent, as we're going through, if you're reading through the scriptures daily, looking at these truths and savoring them, not like on to the next thing or the next point on your to-do list, but really letting these things soak in. This is what the Bible means when it says meditate on the word. I love how in Psalm 119, the psalmist says, your words are like honey. Honey. And as we savor that joy, we realize this is the Father's love speaking to us of who we are. As these things come inside of us, they become a part of us. We start to emanate this joy and it's contagious. And it comes out of us in kind words or simple gestures, ways that we reach out to the ones who have been overlooked and forgotten. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to close today with, um, with a poem from Wendell Berry. And it's one I've read to you guys before at Christmas time, but it's called um, Cited as Not Before. And this idea cited is like given the ability to see. And Wendell Berry was a farmer and a poet. And um, in this poem, he imagines walking into his own barn and finding Mary and Joseph and the baby there. So he says, remembering that it happened once, We cannot turn away the thought as we go out cold to our barns toward the long night's end that we ourselves are living in the world it happened in when it first happened, that we ourselves opening a stall, a latch thrown open countless times before, might find them breathing there, foreknown, the child bedded in straw, the mother kneeling over him, the husband standing in belief, He scarcely can believe in light that lights them from no source we see. An April morning's light, the air around them joyful as a choir. We stand with one hand on the door looking into another world. That is this world, the pale daylight coming just as before, our chores to do, the cattle all awake, our own frozen breath hanging in front of us. And we are here as we have never been before. Sighted as not before, our place, holy, although we knew it not. So I just pray as a blessing for each one of you on this third Sunday of Advent. Advent. May God bless you with joy. May the light of the love of the Father illuminate you and manifest in your heart and shine through you. May his joy be your strength. And may the giving away of that joy to others in the way that only you can do be the light you shine on the world around you this Christmas. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here. We um, are going to have, uh, just for anyone that would like prayer, we'll be, um, Marcia and Sally, will be here to pray afterwards. Um, And join us tonight for Advent at 5. If you need the Zoom link, we can share that with you, but we'd love to have you there. Love you guys. Thank you. Those of you that are here, thanks for coming. And uh, love you. Amen.